Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the AVPA and Sankalp Dialogues, Partnering to Crush the Curve. This, this is the sixth in the series, um, and the title of today's session is Access to Affordable and Adequate Healthcare for COVID-19 Patients. Again, welcome as you're joining us from wherever you are, please uh, use the chat uh, box below to tell us where you're coming from, uh, the area that you're dialing in from this morning or afternoon, um, depending on, on where you are in the world. Good morning, thanks for joining. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to our CEO, Dr. Frank Aswani. Thank you, Toyin, and welcome everyone. Um, uh, wherever you are dialing in from, whether you're in Africa, whether you're out of Africa, welcome. This is a continued series um, of the webinars that we've been having, as Toyin has mentioned. Uh, I'm really grateful to have hosted six so far in partnership with Sankalp and Ariel and the team. Thank you so much for the cooperation and help in making this work. So as people come in, please put in details of where you're dialing in from, uh, what you do, your interest in this particular topic. Would love to hear more about uh, what you're doing, uh, how you're coping, and how you're delivering services and value, and the challenges you're facing, what help you require, all those kind of things. Uh, so as, um, as for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. For those of you who've been with us for the last couple of uh, webinars, thank you for hanging out with us. We appreciate your presence and your time. Uh, as you can see, we are working with Suncup. AVPA is a network of um, social investors who are looking to deploy uh, financial and non-financial resources to our social issues on the continent. And this COVID crisis has been a testing time for the continent in many ways. We are seeing resources um, stretched to limits we've never imagined before. And this topic today is of particular importance because at the core of everything that, we, that is COVID links is, 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 a, is a healthcare crisis. And we want to hear from the current people who are, will be our guest speakers today on how they're coping to offer and provide uh, healthcare services during this crisis. Um, we've seen broadly Africa has faced either an economic or healthcare crisis through this challenge. And we're very keen to see what we can learn from each other. So without further ado, Turn back to you and uh, let's enjoy the session. Thank you very much, Frank. So again, welcome those of you that are joining us. You're joining us at the right time because we're about to kick off our sixth series on access to affordable and adequate health care for COVID-19 uh, patients. So here we go. The first uh, speaker on our lineup, uh, Dr. Kendra Njoku, um, please. Dr. Kendra, over to you. Yes, please. Sure. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're calling um, in the world. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity to the host. I hope everyone is keeping safe. I know we're tired of hearing that, but that's the time we are in. And just heading straight into who MDOC is and how we've responded to COVID company that uses technology, uh, behavioral science, policy improvement methodologies, and evidence-based practice to improve the well-being and health outcomes for the populations we serve. Next slide, please. In response to COVID, um, being a patient-centered, um, you know, organization at its core, next slide, please. We've had um, a bundle of interventions we have rolled out. So first of all, people were confused um, if they suspected they had COVID or a loved one had COVID. And so what we did was on our already existing online directory of services, that is Pan-African for all the um, um, countries in Africa, we superimposed over 200 emergency hotlines and over 500 testing sites, isolation sites, um, treatment sites for 44, as of present, 44 um, 
African countries. And so we were updating this in real time every time. So people, once they go to Navi Health, um, you know, AI, the link, they would be able to put in their country and see the closest, um, um, the hotline to call and the, uh, and the um, closest testing sites to go to. With COVID also, there was really increased anxiety and depression, both among healthcare workers and amongst the, the citizens of, of, you know, of the world. And um, there was also the need to continue to provide um, care for the, especially for the vulnerable groups, given how the shutdown affected the scaling down of routine care at the health facilities. And so, um, we opened up free teleconsultations, um, you know, for a 90 day period for anyone who had, you know, who needed to talk to a health coach or a mental health nurse around depression and all that, or just routine care for their um, chronic disease. On that project, RICOM 3, that we, um, we partner with, we um, provide self guidance and behavioral lifestyle modifications to pregnant women to reduce. Um, indirect causes of maternal mortality. Now with COVID, of course, the anxiety and questions around, um, you know, oh, my routine healthcare um, ANC class is not holding anymore. Um, you know, can, um, what does COVID mean for my pregnancy? And so we had virtual antenatal um, and postnatal care, you know, through phone calls, through our web base, through um, phone calls, through walking them through our web based um, platform called Complete Health, where they could check in their health indices and have a coach call them up and discuss the meaning of that. And also just provide routine ANC and PNC, um, you know, information while, you know, they waited for um, their label. Um, in the same vein um, as that, we also ramped up our tele-education um, sessions. Um, they used to hold monthly, but now hold two weekly for healthcare workers discussing, um, bringing expert knowledge and discussing things around how COVID, um, how COVID management, you know, could affect their management of chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and cancer and all that. We also opened up what we believe for the first time to um, using the ECHO platform, University of Mexico ECHO platform, opened up to pregnant women. And so this, you know, pregnant women were able, and nursing mothers are able to join these live classes that have been holding weekly um, to discuss, you know, things around breastfeeding, um, how to keep safe when they go to the facility for labor, what to pack in their bags, you know, just generally um, how, to, how to keep safe after the baby is born. Do they still have naming ceremonies and all that? Um, so this has been happening and we've seen, you know, a lot of people join in globally, Kenny. Yeah, Kenya moms, um, moms from South Africa, Nigeria, and, and even outside Africa. Um, we've also com um, provided communication materials, very nice um, user-friendly graphics, infographics, guidelines on what to do if you have a chronic disease and at risk for more um, severe COVID. Um, also, in response, we saw a lot of moms afraid of accessing care at the hospitals with all the news all the news flying about oh a pregnant woman went here and then she came back with symptoms did she get it at the hospital also um the healthcare workers saying we don't have enough ppes and so we started a crowdsourced fund drive um to raise ppes that each and with each ppe being able to potentially save four lives so the ppes in the mama delivery kits has PPEs for a doctor, a nurse, and um, the mom and the baby, you, you know, so, and, and that's going on. And we're looking at providing the first batch of these um, delivery kits um, within the week. Next slide, please. And so what are our learnings so far? Um, it's just that when, when you're patient-centered, when you're responding to the needs of the people, when there's a need that you're, and you're responding to a digital transformation in health in Africa can happen overnight. And so pre-COVID, we're like, oh, digital health was not, you know, really being respected as an option of care. And, and this is no way to say it will replace in-person care. Um, but, you know, is there a value? Can it be complementary? And we're like, oh, we Africans, we want to see face-to-face. -face. COVID has said that's not the case. 
people are reaching out over digital platforms to seek care. Um, new models of care. Um, is it possible? Was it possible to think that you know a a a um a pregnant mom with you know secondary um school um certification would be able to um go go to the um and and join a zoom call you know that has showed that you know teleeducation is possible for for patients in wrapping up our um you know what could make us do better partnerships. We really pride ourselves on able to accelerate skills by partnering um, with other organizations. So we're very open to that. Next slide, please. And um, also funding to accelerate scale is also really important. And then if, you, you know, if you're able to join in supporting for the PPEs, um, you know, you can go to www dot my um you know or reach out to me my email is on the screen or my twitter account is on the screen and we'll be able to get back to you we can i can't um end this without just thanking the partners we work with partners like um ms uh, funders like msd for mothers and partners like Japigo and um other partners that we work with thank you so much thank you dr kendra very um insightful and um, valuable contribution that MDOC is, is providing, um, not just um, and, and around the world, uh, in Africa and around the world, like you said, in terms of people that have been uh, affected by your services and what you've been able to provide digitally. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining. Uh, please use the chat box to let us know where you're, where you're coming from, what your interest in this topic is, um, and, it, and again, all the, any questions that you have, please put it in the chat box because at the end, after we've listened to all the speakers, we'll be filled in questions then. So without further ado, we'll move on to, the, to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Babaya Shinaike from the Lagos University Teaching Hospital. Hi, um, can you hear me? Thank you very much. Welcome um, once again, everyone. Let me just give a backdrop that uh, the Lagos University Teaching Hospital is uh, one of the country's foremost tertiary centre situated in Lagos, which um, happens to be the commercial um, um, capital of the country. And being a teaching hospital, obviously, we, uh, we had our own peculiarities and challenges in coping with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. And one of the, uh, the, the pressing issues for us is that the COVID-19 pandemic really has brought to the fore the challenges uh, people have in accessing um, healthcare um, um, even before the pandemic um, came on. And basically, most of our intervention as an institution have been um, um, focused on some of these key drivers um, of um, access to healthcare. And I've just placed there three um, cardinal um, um, groups of um, um, decision-making steps that limit or uh, decide how well people can access healthcare. Decisions taken at the pre-hospital level, decisions taken at the hospital level, and obviously when patients um, leave the hospital, what are the avenues for them? Um, next slide, please. And so as, uh, as, as a hospital, what have we done um, to address some of the issues? And I've realized that one of the major um, um, dr um, key drivers on how well or how quickly people access health, especially um, in the COVID-19 pandemic, has to do with the level of information they have and the ability to make health-seeking decisions. And so what we've done um, at the back end, um, the community health department um, have uh, adopted and are engaging with local council development um, areas um, in the state currently. And what um, this basically um, entails uh, before now, the medical students as part of the community postings um, were roasted to the rural and, and, and urban um, 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 facilities to, to understudy uh, uh, healthcare delivery at the primary healthcare um, level. And before now, this just used to be a, a one-touch um, um, scenario where after the student's posting is over, really there's very little or, or no engagement with the primary healthcare um, facility. But with the COVID-19 pandemic, what we've done more as an, an institution is to adopt some of these uh, local council development areas and are actively engaging with the medical officers of, of health and with the World Health Committee in those local governments. And what this has done for us is that it has given the people 
um, um, valuable um, um, assets to information that they require to make to make decisions to seek help early when it uh, when it comes to their health, especially in the light of the COVID nineteen um, pandemic. We've been able uh, through this uh, medium um, disabuse um, social and um, cultural myth that um, some of them are at the onset of the, the COVID nineteen pandemic as to the origin of the, of the pandemic and, and 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 what some of them need to be doing. And because the Medical Officer of Health have direct access to our consultants in the Community Health Department, it has also made a, a, a transfer and, and, and engagement with us at the front end in the teaching hospital a lot easier. The other thing that we've introduced, which is quite um, 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 interesting, is the phone-in services. Just as Ke um, Dr. Kendra men mentioned earlier on, we operate in a, in a scenario where people prefer uh, they rather come to the hospital than, than have a doctor speak to them over the phone. COVID obviously has also shown that this um, is um, uh, the way to go. And so our specialist clinic, because we had to scale them down because of the, um, um, the need for social distancing, we introduced the phone-in services and uh, 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 the specialist uh, phone numbers are available on the hospital website where um, already registered patients are called by the consultant and new patients who are seeking to access um, 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 health at our facility are directed to the website you call the numbers on the website and um, a specialist responds to you. And if there's a need for you to then come physically to the hospital, we then um, would direct you to do so. One of the, the, the best moment for us, I guess, uh, with this um, and, uh, pandemic is also the, the specialist response team. Now, one thing that we have to keep in view as, as a hospital is the fact that even though patients are being diagnosed with COVID-19, quite a number of them are existing health challenges. Quite a number of them are hypertensive, are diabetic, and quite a number of them also have other issues that the COVID-19 um, 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 scenario uh, then makes access to such specialist care almost impossible. And what we've done as a hospital is that once the patients come to us, access to the specialist care required um, 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 is, is, has, has been done in such a way that you can still access the specialist required. And one of the, our success stories is, is what we've done by, uh, um, in, in our perinatal um, um, units, where uh, the ops and gynae, the pediatrician, the anesthetist, and the nurses, realizing that some of the COVID-19 patients were going to require surgical intervention, decided um, um, to, to scale up and decided to form a, a response team that has, has been involved in caesarean um, um, delivery of a patient requiring um, um, such assistance. And this has worked significantly for us. Um, just earlier this, um, um, this week, we, we had our fourth um, C-section, um, the delivery of a set of twins um, to a 23 year old COVID positive mother. This was part of the myth that we had to rise up to as an institution to, to, to address and to confront um, head on. One thing that has also worked for us quite well during this pandemic to ensure access to healthcare is that um, quite a number of um, 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 public um, 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 and private and individuals are partnered with us, especially in the provision of um, valuable um, resources like the PPEs. Government is doing its own part um, locally, but um, obviously as it, it is with the, with the global scenario, um, um, having people partner with you is definitely a welcome scenario. Next slide, please. And so what have we learned? Obviously, um, one of the, the, the things that we learned that we are improving upon is um, understanding how to strengthen the primary healthcare level realize that the decision that, that the individuals will make to seek help in, in formal settings starts with the access that they have to information at the primary care level. And so uh, we, we, our community health department is working actively at ensuring that we engage more, uh, as, uh, as I said earlier on, at the local council development area with the medical officer of health, with the, with the, with the, with the health committee at the ward level, make information available to them, make case definition easier to understand, uh, pass messages across to them in ways that they can understand and as such, make it easier for these individuals not only to be enlightened, but also to own the, uh, to, to, to own the, 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 the responsibility um, about, about their health and how to respond during the COVID pandemic. The other thing that obviously we are, we, we are looking at improving, obviously, is in the area of the phone-in services. How do we standardize the response across um, all the specialist units such that um, people get um, the same um, um, some, um, significant degree of, of care and attention when they call in and do not feel shortchanged uh, by the phone-in services? We're also looking at expanding the channels and the modes of communication 
Zoom obviously and other platform have shown to us that it is possible for people to access um, healthcare while outside the hospital and, and still not lose um, significant touch with their, um, with their caregivers. We're also looking at um, communicating to them at the grassroots level in ways that they understand. So the public health department are looking at um, 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 are doing, are doing grassroots rally and doing grassroots meetings with the, with the people at that community level. Next slide, please. Now, what are the areas that we're looking at going forward with this pandemic? Obviously, as I said earlier on, um, tele, um, um, telemedicine and, and phone services is, is, is one area that as a teaching hospital, we, we were not used to before the COVID-19 pandemic and we had to, to, adapt, um, we, we had to adopt and we had to um, adapt our, our processes to embrace. And therefore going forward, this is one um, um, area obviously that uh, we, we are open to people who have, have been in this, in this process to help, um, 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 help us streamline the process, expand it if possible to telemedicine where people can, can, can be at their various um, location and they can call in. Obviously, one of the challenges we've seen early on because, um, is the fact that the, the phone-in services require that, that the, the, the patient have to pay. It's not a toll-free number. And so we're looking at an um, area, uh, situ situation where people can actually call in and these numbers can be toll-free. And, and we, we believe that this obviously will, imp uh, will improve the interest and will improve the ownership um, of the process by the, um, by the people. And obviously, as I said, an expansion to uh, being able to then sell if, um, uh, face and, and see the patient and the, the patient's interface with their doctors as well. Retaining and, reta uh, 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 training and retaining of, of manpower. We realize that especially at the primary health care level, uh, when um, this um, 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 health care workers are trained, uh, retaining them at that primary health care level that is at close proximity to the end users that require the services then becomes difficult either because of, of, of of accommodation um, in, in, in the facility or uh, because of, of some other logistics. And so these are um, um, areas where we believe that um, um, donor agencies and, 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 and partners can come in um, with the training and, and with provision of facilities to help keep the trained manpower. And lastly, obviously, is in the area of the, the, the provision of the PPE. This is one area where, where as a teaching hospital, the health care workers on the front line who are the ones who have to day in, day out um, 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 treat this patient, um, feel that um, um, more can still, can still be done to ensure that, um, that, that this, the safety is, is, is guaranteed while they come from. Um, you, Dr. Labiemi, but if you can just wrap up uh, in about uh, 20 seconds so we can move yeah, on. Yeah, that, that actually is my last slide and I'm pretty much uh, done now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is the picture of, of, of our set of twins delivered uh, by our, our specialist team in the course of this pandemic. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your, your work in Luth and, and also, you know, out of all of this crisis to have um, some inspiration come out of it with the delivery of the twins. Um, so thank you. We're now going to move on to the audience poll to tell us what you think. Where's the poll question, please? All right. What do you think is the biggest barrier to getting access to healthcare? Please um, pick the, which answer goes with the one that you think is the biggest barrier, healthcare affordability, lack of money, access to healthcare, centers proximity, lack of knowledge and information on healthcare, fear and social stigma associated with health issues. So which one do you think is the biggest barrier? Another five seconds and then we'll get the results, please. Okay. Results? Wow. <laughs> so 68% overwhelmingly believe that it's health care, affordability, lack of money, and uh, health insurance. That's the biggest barrier to getting access to health care. Thank you very much.
So we're going to move on. As, as we mentioned, we have four good speakers this morning. So, and in the interest of time, we're going to move on to our next speaker from Access Afia, Melissa Menke. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa and I'm the founder of Access Afia. We are a primary healthcare company that operates in Nairobi and we run a network of clinics that uh, we call Clinic 2.0. So essentially our model is tech enabled primary healthcare. We use technology to do all of the things that technology can gain us efficiencies in, in terms of driving down the cost of care and improving patient outcomes. Examples of that are having second opinion software available at our clinics, having telemedicine connect patients on site to remote specialists, having automation in the back end on repetitive healthcare operations, and having digital engagement strategies with our patients in between visits. We also incorporate elements of lean health into our model. So our clinics are about one and a half times the size of a standard shipping container. And inside of that, we prioritize the use of rapid and digital diagnostics, shareable assets, uh, connected clinics. So having one central lab being able to serve the full network. Um, and this model ultimately allows us to be able to treat over 90% of what drives people into our doors on site and also achieve pretty compelling uh, clinical results. So last year, 98% of the patients that we served in our slum-based microclinics told us that they felt better within three days of a visit. We maintained 98% stock availability um, for the entire year in contrast to about 52% at, at the public sector. Our net promoter score, which is a measure of patient satisfaction, was around six times the national average for, for healthcare providers. Um, in Kenya, and we achieved over 90% protocol adherence um, to best practice medical, medical guidelines in, in our sites every single time. So, um, and, and where we've gotten today is we have a network of 17 clinics um, in four different counties in Kenya. Next slide, please. What we're working on with COVID is we've divided our response into three key response areas. We have um, have an emphasis on staying open safely. So making sure that our staff have PPEs, that we've reworked the entire patient flow. So our elderly and immunosuppressed patients come in first thing when they have the clinics to themselves. And we've done a variety of, of innovations around just keeping the network of 17 sites open and serving patients. We've also done a lot of work around patient education. So getting real information into people's hands. But what I'll zoom in on for today's presentation is the way that we've been thinking about telemedicine. I think this is a trend because I've heard both uh, previous speakers mention this work. So what I'll kind of focus on um, and, and try to bring from our perspective is how, how we've gotten it to work in the ultra low income areas that we serve. Um, so I, I should have mentioned that all 17 of our sites are located in informal settlements. So really focusing on people who are working casually or for themselves and earning between two and 500 shillings a day. So when we thought about how to build inclusive telemedicine for, for low income populations, the first thing we, uh, we looked at is what sort of features would needed to be kind of added on to a conventional web and app based telemedicine medicine platform to, to facilitate that type of care. We've programmed in USSD uh, integrations, we've programmed in M-PESA prepay, and we've also worked on having a, a, a request for a doctor to call you back. So you can essentially um, ping our platform and, and get a phone call. Um, we rolled out our, we did our initial rollout with patients who were seeing us already for antenatal care, diabetes, and hypertension, because these are three groups where we have uh, long-term kind of sticky relationships with, and the tech adoption was, was easier because we had more face-to-face -face contact to explain how things worked before we did our second rollout, which was to general population for, for teletriage. So how this looks and feels like um, for us in a kind of closed loop system is a patient can send a USSD request to go through a diabetes consult over the phone. One of our clinicians from the clinic that they would normally go to will call them back. They will do some lifestyle coaching. They'll talk through results. They'll talk about their condition over the phone. Medications might be adjusted based on that conversation and they will then get an e-prescription 
um, sent to them, which they then have the option of paying with M-Pesa from their home. So really all they need to do is come to the clinic, show the confirmation, pick up meds, and be in and out within, within 30 seconds. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, some of the insights that we've learned, I think that, that one of the things that my team and I were reflecting on is one of the things we had in Kenya was a bit of the benefit of time. So from an operational perspective, getting to learn you know, in February from PPE shortages, from challenges of, of overwhelmed health systems, we were really able to, to plan our operations and felt like the rollout of protecting staff, protecting patients, um, and keeping things safe rolled out relatively well. One of the things that we were pleasantly surprised about was how COVID-19 for us has really accelerated certain types of, of partnerships, both with people who were looking to, to support our efforts, but also with innovative insurance companies and other organizations that were looking to build new products and also innovate their businesses the way that it sounds like all of us on this call are, are, are innovating ours. One of the things that we that I think is an important insight is while the the medical uh, response from our end was very controlled, the um, the actual uh, patient support side is something that needs a ton more investment in. The reality is that probably all of our patients right now need some sort of subsidy because they have a complete absence of a social safety net and, um, and are, are working casually, and, and many of them have, have lost or reduced work over the last two months. So we're certainly seeing a complete pinch. We're seeing our average spend per visit drop, um, and in the absence of, of really good partners, it's difficult for us to respond to that economic kind of um, these huge economic challenges completely on our own. So next slide, please, which kind of rolls into what, what, what we need. So one of the things we're really looking at is patient support partners. We have a program we've launched with Give Directly to do unconditional cash transfer. We've been really escalating our most vulnerable groups, such as, such as our chronic care patients and our, our pregnant women and new mothers for these programs, um, and we'll continue to add more. But I think that, that that will just be kind of scratching the surface of, of, of what's needed for the economic recovery. So we're looking at partners who can step up for, to help us make sure that babies continue to get immunized, women stay on family planning, um, and people who have Medicaid, either predictable medication routines or are coming in for emergency or acute care can continue to get the, the services they need. That really links in with, with number two on that side which is health financing partners. We've already seen some really interesting uh, creative partnerships um, around insurance um, and, and people coming to us, but that absolutely needs to be accelerated because the majority of, of the market is uninsured. And as everybody on the call knows, as we saw from the poll, um, we actually have, uh, we, we all know that, that affordability and health financing is probably the biggest challenge we're, we're facing right now. Um, and then of course, as an organization, we're looking for funding and specifically very technical funding because we want to continue to build out new features on our, our virtual care platform, but also be able to integrate this more and more with partners who want to be able to use the functionality that we've built as well. Uh, so thank you all and I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Melissa. And again, another platform that's helping to provide access to people in terms of your digital um, e, um, for the prescriptions and, and also for uh, a platform that people can use for telemedicine and, and addressing you know, patients' care, uh, patients' needs. Uh, at this point, again, want to encourage everyone to put your questions in the um, chat box as we're going to our last uh, speaker for today. Um, Dr. Steve Adudans from, from Hewatele. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Adudans. I'm the CEO of Hewatele. Um, Hewatele is a Swahili word for plentiful of air. And uh, we're in the business of uh, saving lives one breath at a time by setting up oxygen ecosystems uh, that are sustainable and through partnership models to ensure that oxygen is accessible at all levels of care. Oxygen still remains a challenge in Sub-Saharan Africa and is almost 10 to 13 times much more expensive compared to the Western counterparts. In light of COVID-19, we are seeing that there is going to be a lot more work that is done 
to ensure that oxygen is made accessible, especially for facilities that have been set up as isolation uh, centers. Hewatela is a public-private partnership model in Kenya that has set up three oxygen plants that are generating oxygen, distributing the oxygen through a mail command delivery model to facilities, and also uh, coupling that with training for healthcare workers. Our main aim is to sort out three challenges, and that is access, affordability, and safety. Uh, for access is through a delivery model, and for affordability using a, a pressure swing adsorption technology, we cut down the cost of oxygen by at least 30%. And for safety, we equip healthcare workers with pulse oximetry training, and also uh, we also give them training on how to prescribe uh, patients uh, who need oxygen. Now, our responses to COVID-19 are to support the prioritization of improving access to oxygen by helping the government to supplement that which uh, most patients need, and that is uh, affordable and high quality oxygen. We are also optimizing oxygen generation in our plants uh, through the acquisition of more uh, bottles or cylinders that we refill and distribute to facilities. Currently, we are supporting uh, 100, over 150 facilities across uh, at least 20 counties in Kenya, improving the lives of at least 300,000 people. Each of our plants can serve a population of about 5 million. And this has cut down the monopoly that exists in much of Sub-Saharan Africa. We also want to, uh, we are improving the knowledge and the changing the practice of uh, the clinicians because we know that 13% of clinicians are in, um, at risk of getting infected with COVID and therefore uh, educating them on uh, personal protective uh, equipment like donning and doffing of gowns and, and, and other PPEs. Is, is very important. At the same time, we also equip them with those equipment. Lastly, is, uh, we have we are part of global and national advocacy uh, 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 platforms like the Every Breath accounts, where we are advocating for investment on homegrown and sustainable responses to COVID-19, especially when it comes to access to oxygen. Next slide, please. Now, we've learned a lot, even as we have been uh, uh, responding to COVID. Uh, one of the critical areas that we've learned is infection prevention and control, uh, which cuts across um, um, actually from the health uh, care perspective to the population level perspective. So ensuring that PPEs and the disinfection and sterilization protocols are disseminated is very important. And ensuring that also the population understands uh, the prevention mechanisms that needs to be put. Now, oxygen administration also is critical, especially before intensive care. Now, we know that some patients actually need intensive care um, when they are at a critical stage, but oxygen remains an important drug just before they reach intensive care. A lot of the facilities right now that are taking care of the patients are equipped with the intensive care uh, facilities and especially uh, ventilation for those patients. Um, and we are working with the, the facilities to ensure that oxygen is accessible for those who need ventilation. The government currently has entered into agreement with the World Bank to uh, purchase ventilators that are going to increase uh, access to intensive care for patients who need ventilation in the uh, in the country. Next slide, please. Now, what do we need to scale? I think there's more investment that is needed to ensure that oxygen is accessible at all levels of care. Right now, we are able to reach uh, facilities that ha that have uh, some that have primary health care, um, but majorly uh, some that majority of the facilities that we're able to reach are the ones that at least do have um, some level of secondary care. So PPP models, we feel uh, is a, a very, very um, you know, feasible and sustainable model that can be replicated anywhere. Uh, leasing models, uh, especially for governments, can be very, very useful. Uh, the other thing is making oxygen safe. 
we need to increase training for equipping uh, the healthcare workers, uh, whether with the parts oximeters or PPEs, and then also piping of facilities to ensure safe administration of oxygen. Uh, oxygen still remains uh, one of the uh, drugs that can also be injurious, especially to babies who are less than 30 days. So therefore, uh, ensuring that oxygen is, is made safe for, uh, for babies, as well as adults, is very, very important. I think um, I'd be happy to ask you maybe to uh, go to our website, uh, hewatele.org, I look at the work that we're doing so that at least we're able to interact with you. We can share some of the playbooks of things that we can be able to um, uh, help other countries, other, other setups in sub-Saharan Africa to set up a sustainable oxygen generation ecosystem. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Steve. And again, thank you for the work that you're doing to uh, build up the oxygen ecosystem and what's needed for patients, not just now during COVID, but also you know, throughout this. This is a, an important um, you know, area that needs to be strengthened and, and, and uh, focused on making sure that we have safe um, oxygen. Um, so moving on to our audience question and answer session, what are some of the questions that you have for our speakers? Please put them in the chat box. We already have a few that we'll start off with from Laura to Dr. Babayemi. What are the items for the PPEs needed at LASU um, and average cost of the total PPEs needed per healthcare worker? Um, all right, thank you, um, um, Laura. Uh, one of the, the essential um, PPEs that we're looking at currently would be the N95 face mask, uh, the face shields, uh, the surgical um, gloves um, and, and surgical masks, and then the disposable um, aprons. Um, on the average, um, I don't know which country you are operating, um, or you're calling from to be able to give you the currency uh, denomination. But um, on the average for each time uh, a healthcare worker has to um, review a patient and, and, and adopt um, any of this um, um, facility, you'll be requiring close to about 20,000, that's in Nigerian, Naira, which would be um, an equivalent of about um, 50 US dollars, thereabouts, per healthcare worker per use. Yeah, thank you, okay. Uh, moving on to the next question, um, this one is for Melissa. Can your e-prescriptions only be filled out at your pharmacies or uh, other pharmacies? Can, can people go to other pharmacies and still be able to get their prescription filled? They can be filled anywhere. It's, it's just a normal prescription signed by a clinician or a physician. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. Moving on to another question for um, Dr. Kendra, what what are the con con um, what are the content contestants uh, of the PPE um, Mama delivery kits? What are inside the kits? I guess. Okay, so I, I guess that means the content. Um, yes, content so exactly. For, for <laughs> each kit, um, you have an isolation gown and a suit for one nurse and one doctor. Um, we have the face shield and the N95 max um, and, and regular surgical max for, and gloves. For the mom, you have face max to cover at least one daily for a three day hospital stay, um, a hand sanitizer for the mom to maintain hygiene as well as a swaddle blanket for the baby that has um, danger signs and um, and safe practices to guide the mom on care for the baby. Okay. So another question for Melissa. Uh, you mentioned partnerships with insurance firms. Um, give us an example of how insurance is helping the most needy access healthcare through your platform. So I guess maybe two things to highlight and I saw something pop up later. So I'll also just be transparent. We still have around 90% of our patients paying cash. So this is definitely not tipped the scale for us in terms of, uh, of having, you know, 
completely widespread uptake at the BOP. But two interesting things we've been working on. One is with a group called Insurance for All. And what they've developed with us is a capitation model. So instead of having a fee-for-service model where a patient could use any in-network clinics, because our prices are so low, a patient can pay about 50% of the normal premium if they agree to use our, our current network of facilities. And, and now that that's grown a bit, it allows them to, to you know, maybe have one near work, one near home. So, so that's been one way we've been thinking about it, is how can, how can the private sector's use of capitation actually be able to then drive down premiums for, for low-income patients? Um, that's with insurance for all. Another thing that we're looking at, um, this isn't live though yet, is my Turaco is looking at ways that we can essentially take um, an even more stripped down version of our telemed. So instead of having USSD lead to a phone call or a web consult, actually having it just um, lead into a simple chat. Uh, so it wouldn't have to be a call at one time, but being able to essentially ask a question to a clinician. And, and that will kind of help uh, you know, sort of triage and sort of sort people in terms of using the right level of care. Um, I, I guess, you know, that doesn't necessarily increase access instantly, but what it does do in the long term is help patients use the more appropriate level of the care system, which can drive down costs and premium kind of more in the medium term. Okay. Thank you for that uh, response. This is a question um, to Dr. Steve. Um, are there any measures taken to ensure that um, you know prices for medicines are reasonable, especially to the gra to the grassroots level? And in your case, it would be your focus on oxygen, obviously. Yeah, thank you for your question. I think um, uh, for the Kenya government, what they have done to ensure that at least um, the cost of healthcare is uh, is affordable, uh, there is a national health uh, insurance fund. Uh, that funds, um, uh, you know, mothers who go to uh, uh, deliver, would be mothers who go to deliver in facilities um, through what they call the Linda Mama um, initiative. This is a, as ensured that um, uh, deliveries are made free of charge. Uh, similarly, also lower level facilities um, are now being taken up through uh, the uh, universal health coverage uh, initiative that is a flagship, um, uh, you know, pillar in the current administration in Kenya, and this includes up to uh, the provision of um, uh, life-saving oxygen. So the government is quite committed to ensuring that uh, healthcare is affordable, especially for bottom of the pyramid uh, in Kenya. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, this is a question again, and you know, to Dr. Kendra. Um, what do you have? Have you? Has there been any issues with digital and healthcare literacy as people are trying to use your platform? Um, um, definitely, um, and so we've seen. Um, you know, improvement. And so when people come, m most people take smartphone use to be um, digital literacy, but many people have smartphones, but don't know, j j just use the basic functions of it. Don't know, don't use it to full capacity. And so our health coaches have had to, and our IT support team have had to have you know, videos made, you know, um, screenshots made that teach women how to access the um, digital health tools that we provide, as well as in-person um, coaching um, on calls, walking them through how to use their devices to access healthcare on our complete health platform. Um, we have also seen that most times when at baseline we give people, um, you know, questions around their thoughts, they, people tend to score themselves higher in their confidence um, about knowing what to do, efficacy, knowing what to do about their health to, to get good health care. But when we now come to chatting directly with them, either through our support groups, um, platforms, or individually, we notice that even the basic questions, like a woman doesn't understand what blood pressure means or what the normal value is. She just knows that it's checked regularly at the hospital. So we've seen digital and health literacy improve as we work with this um, cohort of members. Thank you for that. Um, this question is for Dr. Shinaike. Have you 
um, considered doing safe recycling of N95 respirators using plasma sterilizer? And would you consider the provision of the sterilizer on a PPP basis? Okay, um, um, thank you very much. We actually uh, uh, use our, our uh, N95 on a recycle basis, which means that once we give um, uh, one to a healthcare worker as part of uh, trying to ensure that we don't run out of the stock, one is actually used, um, which is consistent with some um, experience worldwide uh, for about three or four cycles before uh, we then discard such. Um, using the, um, the particular um, um, use of plasma uh, uh, to recycle, we haven't looked into that, but hey, we, we're open to it. And, and if, um, if you want to reach out and help us in that regard, why not? We'll be very open to it. Okay, great. The, this question is for um, Melissa. Um, please confirm if all 17 mini clinics remain open or if the telehealth service uh, caters for, um, and if telehealth um, services center cater to the low income clients, do some of the clients pay cash or they all uh, register under community-based health insurance? So, so we, we had, question. yeah. We, we had 19, we closed two. So the 17 that we kept are staying open and staying open safely. Uh, the two that were closed were, were very low volume. So it was done kind of under that, for that reason. Uh, the, for the telemed, so what we've done is we've put differential pricing onto it. So if you access it through USSD, it's actually free um, because our assumption is people who are choosing to use that, that, that's what we're marketing to our patients. That's kind of the flyers and messaging that are going up in, in the target groups in sort of low income. Although of course we don't have any sort of income test on that. Um, so that would just be a free phone call from a doctor. If you access our web-based platform or go through through the app, then, then you would pay. And the payment is differentiated. So it's uh, 300 shillings for a clinician, 600 for a physician, and, and 1,200 for a specialist. What, what groups have done to ease that, um, although this really more benefits formal workers, is groups have, um, we've signed up a couple of organizations under group pay models. So then the patient doesn't pay, but the employer is billed at the end of the month based on usage and have also rolled out various coupon codes with partners um, and are willing to do that with more partners. If they would take on some of the marketing costs, then they can get up to 66% off for the people that they onboard onto the system for us. Are the clinic 24 hours open 24 hours? No, so so we under normal operations we did eleven hours a day, and actually because of curfew, uh, we are needing to close between six and six thirty, depending on the site. Um, partially just because that's then what makes our even though our healthcare workers are technically exempt from curfew, it's so difficult for patients to move around um, after that time that that we're just having to to close to make everyone feel safer. Great. Okay. Um, a combination question for Dr. Steve. Um, how far down do, do you supply oxygen and do, and do your training? Um, do you go down to the um, primary health care facilities? And also, um, can you tell us what has been done to make sure hospitals have ventilator, ventilate, ventilators, uh, assuming that, you know, obviously that uh, um, COVID-19 patients would need um, oxygen? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, right now, we are in three counties that host the oxygen plants, and uh, the oxygen plants uh, serve facilities spanning across 20 counties out of the 47 in, uh, in Kenya. Um, for the host counties, we're able to go as far as almost primary healthcare um, level because we have an agreement uh, with uh, the host county government to ensure uh, uninterruptible oxygen uh, supply uh, for their facilities at an affordable cost. Um, now, that has enabled us at least to have a way to reduce our overheads because they're able to uh, ensure that we have access to some of these facilities um, and they're able to make the orders. For the other counties, it depends on what they do want, but um, with our model, we're able to go down how do we reduce our overheads for distribution? We, we have um, had to adopt an agency and a depot model 
uh, where we set up uh, depots for facilities that are quite far from uh, where the oxygen generating plants are. Uh, and this is a model that is used by many logistic companies um, that distribute their products. So, so that has allowed us to reduce uh, transport costs and reduce the cost of oxygen subsequently. In terms of intensive care, uh, the government originally uh, had what we call the managed equipment scheme, where they signed up with the original equipment manufacturers and in this case, ventilators to set up at least, um, I think it was 11 uh, ICUs. Now, we see the need to have more ICUs in Kenya because of COVID and the government has already, uh, you know, uh, broke a deal with the uh, World Bank and one of our good partners is going to be supporting the rollout of ventilators uh, to uh, the government facilities in order to ensure that uh, patients do not have to travel long distances to access intensive care. So, so that is already ongoing um, and, and um, the country should, should have more ventilators. On our part, as an oxygen generation and distribution partner, we are working with the government to ensure that they set up uh, sustainable oxygen generation models for supporting these ventilators because without oxygen, these ventilators will not be able to work effectively. And especially, so not just uh, oxygen, but high quality, high purity uh, oxygen. So, so that is really ongoing and there's conversation at the national and subnational levels. Thank you. Thank you. This is a question to all the, the uh, panelists, uh, as speakers today. And before we go in there, we're, I'm looking at the time and we have about three minutes. So um, to, the, to the audience and to the speakers, please, uh, if you have the time, please stay on because we'll continue to field some of these questions. And this question definitely uh, is a question that I think everyone is uh, curious about. And that is, as you know, um, right now in all of Africa, we haven't seen the increase of a lot of um, overburden of the healthcare system with COVID-19 patients. Why is it that this has not happened? And you know, are we, uh, is the worst yes, yet to come? Or have, have we, or is there something that's going on in Africa that's causing us to, to not have as much um, in terms of an overburden healthcare system. We can start with uh, Dr. Kendra and then go in the order that you spoke. <laughs> okay. I mean, my key, my key thought around this would be, first of all, data um, and the testing capacity. And so the, you know, the admissions or confirmed cases is really based on the testing capacity um, of the country or of the continent. And so if we check uh, testing numbers as against other continents and the burden of disease, then we can begin to say, um, are our present numbers a true reflection um, of that? Um, also, in terms of, you know, deaths happening, we have lots, many deaths that happen on the continent um, without a clear, confirmed cause of death. Um, so, so basically, I would say this is all um, based on, um, you know, ha has a reflection of the capacity of testing we're doing and um, the clarity around our data systems and um, apportioning, you know, what is really a cause of that. I'll just say in addition to that, um, and it's also the fact that uh, COVID-19 has basically also reflected the use of um, health services in Africa generally. Um, just as Dr. Kendra said, um, quite a number of people are dying outside of the mainstream established hospital setting that are not being captured. Um, and you also have quite a number of deaths that are not even investigated. I mean, uh, um, Nigeria comes to mind, quite a number of states have been unaccount um, deaths that are not accounted, uh, accounted for and the cause of which we are not very um, sure about. And I think it also speaks to the fact that during this pandemic also, the the use of the, um, uh, the, the, the mainstream hospital system has somewhat also reduced and uh, people are actually turning towards quite a number of um, uh, interesting options from the religious 
um, um, setting to the other local uh, means of, um, of of seeking healthcare, and those would never come to uh, to the mainstream data uh, to reflect the exact burden that we are having um, in this pandemic. I think that it's, you know, I can only echo what some of the previous speakers have said about data. I think another, you know, reality is that in Kenya specifically, 77% of the COVID cases that have been identified were asymptomatic. So the reality is we probably do have a lot more, but potentially not um, a lot more incredibly severe cases. Um, I know just you know, anecdotally from what we're seeing day to day in the in the clinics and the facilities we're running is, you know, in about normal proportion of respiratory cases, but a lot more concern and fear for those. Um, only two cases out of the 8,000 a month we've been seeing have had the incredibly severe um, kind of abnormal respiratory symptoms that made us escalate it to national testing centers. Um, so yeah, I think I think I would echo that we certainly have have more in in Kenya than has been recorded, but because of the asymptomatic nature of the majority of our cases, widespread testing, you know, echoing the other speakers is the only way that we will get that full picture, and that's certainly in in our ministry's medium term plans that they've that they've published. Um, I'll I'll also just echo the. Uh, the, the, the previous speakers, what we've said. So um, I would say for Kenya, just like Melissa said, uh, testing capacity is very important. And even Dr. Kendra has mentioned, uh, we started out with a very, very um, you know, um, weak testing capacity with long lead times and, and also uh, turnaround times for, for the test results. So, so we uh, most likely had a lot of asymptomatic uh, patients or, or suspects who um, actually recovered and, um, um, and, and therefore was not reported. So um, with the testing capacity that right now, now is becoming much better, especially like now for Kenya, uh, then we're seeing uh, a rise in cases. Secondly, I think is uh, also a social cultural thing of um, how epidemics some, uh, you know, like usually pan out in, uh, in Africa. There is usually the fear to go to a facility because of um, you know, patients maybe are dying at the facility. You've seen this with Ebola. So, so, so even for people who have the symptoms, they fear to go to the hospital to try and get a test. So, so they'll rather wait it out until maybe they feel that you know, right now it's 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 um, it's quite advanced, and that has has led to a number of people who uh, may go through the symptoms and and recover without being uh, confirmed as as a test case. Um, but lastly, also is that um, as, as a continent, we we watch fully weighted um, as as um, the rest of the continent was doing a number of things. So we started uh, wrapping up some of the preventive mechanisms uh, like like masks and and all. And and by the time we started getting an upsurge of cases, it was um, uh, we were in to some extent. Uh, had spread out the the information for for the population to start taking measures, uh, and therefore that has led to a bit of um, quite a bit of a control, um, which which may be anecdotal and and um, another here or there, but 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 has helped. Um, yeah. So thank you all for for that. We are four minutes after the hour. And just again, want to say that uh, thank you everyone for, for staying on uh, for another uh, maybe 10 minutes or so to ask um, uh, some more questions of our very um, good speakers this morning on this very, very important topic, access to um, affordable and adequate healthcare for COVID-19 patients. Um, so at this point, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Please raise your hand. If you, if you have a question for any of our speakers at this point. While we're waiting for someone to, to raise their hand, um, you know, maybe we could um, again ask um, any of the speakers to answer, maybe, you know, maybe Melissa, I'll, I'll 
call on you to answer this question. Um, looking at the, the telemedicine and the platform that you're using, how are you educating the public around the importance of um, you know, not having face-to-face -face because our culture is a face-to-face -face culture. And now that we're being forced to use technology, how has that changed um, your business? Yeah, completely. And, and telemedicine was the one thing that even in very kind of smartphone heavy countries like the US was always called the last frontier in, in digital um, and, and people just didn't use it. So I think that the first thing I'll say um, before I get into education is the reality is because, you know, I think some of the other speakers have referenced this because people are more nervous to go to health facilities because they don't want to contract COVID, you are seeing more natural demand. So our first few users were just actually Googling, you know, telemedicine Kenya and, and finding the site that, that we've been running for this year. So there has been a little bit more organic demand. Um, and I think that it's absolutely now is the time. You know, for us, we kind of pivoted from using telemedicine as a second opinion service in clinics to only going direct to consumer during COVID. But others who have been doing direct to consumer for a while, I think we're all in a similar place of of having um, the kind of sense of urgency that, that people feel to get remote care. Um, so there's a bit more organic demand, I guess. So we, we rolled out in a phased launch and the first way we launched telemed was through people who were coming to the clinic often anyways. So our diabetics, our hypertensives, um, our pregnant women, our new mothers. And so we actually used a face-to-face -face visit to onboard someone onto the digital platform. So saying, okay, your next visit is now scheduled through the MDoctari app, and this is how you access it. And if you don't want to use the app, then actually this is how you would get us to call you. So, so our, our, all of our first work was kind of high touch. Um, the second thing we did in phase one is just to gauge people's willingness to interact with us online. We set up WhatsApp support groups. So this wasn't medical consultations, no prescriptions were shared, but it was just an opt-in for, um, for, again, these, these same three groups. Uh, to see who would actually opt in. And that gave us a proxy for who's willing to interact with us online versus who are we going to need to use this more kind of phone call based um, and mod an SMS based model for. Um, and then we use WhatsApp for those who did opt in to then educate them about how to, to sign up. Um, we're essentially just kind of entering phase two to now, so it's sort of early days of us doing the rollout to all of our patients, not just these special groups. And what we're using is, first of all, digital marketing, which is, I guess if I'm honest, moderately effective for the market we're looking at um, in terms of kind of ultra low income, uh, but, but decently effective in terms of re reaching a slightly broader audience with our, with our products and services. Um, what we're looking at doing for people who then don't respond to to digital marketing is actually still doing some high touch education. So hanging signs and flyers in the community because even though we're on a quasi restricted movement scenario, everyone's out and about, you know, buying fruits, buying vegetables in the community. So trying to ha have more poster signs and instructional visuals available in the areas that we're trying to target. This um, last question and and then um, I noticed that no one is uh, raising their hand so I'm going to direct this last question thank you Mel Melissa for that uh, to Dr. Uh, Oshinaike around um, you know again looking at the federal teaching hospital uh, Luth and uh, you know what are some of the interventions that the you know government is doing to ensure that um, you know with your institution to ensure that there's affordable and adequate um, care for, for the COVID-19 patients. Thank you. Um, first, um, let me talk about the, the, the ones um, who are coming in to seek um, intervention first at the ER and um, at other points of entry to the hospital. Um, one thing that we, we, we definitely have stepped up to is the fact that um, COVID-19 um, as it is, is gonna be uh, with us for a while and that most um, um, of the other health challenges must be looked at in the light of their merits and not just um, label the patient as COVID um, 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 and then move away from the patient, which was what um, was the challenge we had at the onset of this pandemic because um, the, the whole process of getting them tested and isolated for care in some stand uh, uh, alone hospital was uh, becoming an issue. 
And so what um, hospitals um, um, have had to do, and, and I speak um, from my local context, is that we've had to come to, to that reality that whether the patient is COVID positive or not, they have specific health needs. Mm -hmm. And those health needs must still be addressed. And so there is the, uh, the increased sense of awareness um, in, the, in, in, in the teaching hospital community that the, the existing health challenges and comorbidities must be attended to. And so we're having quite a number of our, of our frontline healthcare workers come to, um, to uh, the, the table and, and, and making um, the decision that we are not going to have collateral debts just because patients are COVID positive. And so there's, there's that increased commitment. Secondly, um, the government has done its bit, and, 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 and I, I must say that globally, um, every, every um, federal um, establishment is, um, is challenged with the enormous task of having to provide PPE. PPEs are being used up in, 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 in a certain way that before now wasn't the, the usual person. And um, even when you have um, the fund accessing, being able to get the PPEs um, to your facility then becomes another challenge. And I know that this is one area that government and, and in my institution will be very open to uh, public and private partnership and uh, quite a number of private donors coming to the, uh, to the table. The top part, which is quite instructive also, is that currently the health bill of the COVID-19 um, patients who are admitted in my facility are entirely taken by the government. In other words, every drug they use, um, the feeding and every other um, um, service that um, they require is actually borne currently by the government. Uh, no COVID-19 patient has had to pay a dime in my facility for any test run or for their meals or for, for the, the hospital stay. The government um, and, and, um, and, 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 and treats partnership with, with donor agency has basically been responsible for that as well. And I guess that, that was also the government's way of encouraging people to come forward knowing that they will receive care at no cost to them. Thank you very much. Um, just one uh, last comment before uh, we wrap up. Um, from uh, Timothy Adeboale has said that sincerely, we have not seen any sense of pandemic, respiratory distress, or unexplain unexplainable deaths in our community. These cannot be hidden, except we, um, we, are, we are talking about asymptomatic infections, not just about testing. It appears COVID-19 is behaving differently here. So if, if I may, I just want to ask uh, Timothy to um, give a little bit of context around that comment, because that's a very interesting comment. Uh, <clears throat> Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, Timothy? Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, go ahead. Hello. Hello, good morning. We can hear you, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, yes, yeah, trying to put context to my comment is, I mean, we don't have this feel. Yes, we've always, we've been hiding behind that maybe we're not testing, it's, it's testing enough people, that's why we're not having the numbers climbing. Yes, maybe we're talking about asymptomatic, but the way uh, in our communities, there's no way you can hide some of these issues. Unexplainable deaths uh, in community, if you're a community person, you, there's no way you have a feel something is going on. People are dying unexplainably. People are having respiratory distress and uh, they need to be rushed to hospitals. But that's not coming on in the mainstream, ordinary community life, really, that we see. So there's still something about COVID-19 behaving differently here. Uh, yes, with the, the hypothesis of environment and the sun and the humidity are there. Uh, so uh, I think we're just fortunate because we don't have sufficient uh, facilities to handle. So that's why it's uh, staying in the places where they have sufficient facilities. So that's good for us and we give place to go for that. Uh, so we can't just hide on the uh, just uh, cover up by saying because we're not testing enough. Mm -hmm. I think we're not having uh, the, 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 sufficient, the, the level of uh, infectivity and the severity of the illness here uh, in the sub, well, Kenya, it's also, uh, we are all in similar climate. So 
think that's the advantage I think we have uh, over this COVID-19 issue. But except we have to wait and see what goes on. We don't expect anything worse really, but uh, lucky us. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, context. Um, a lot of people are responding though to your comments and saying that they're, well, in, in Nigeria, especially in the Northern part, there's a lot of, uh, a lot more, um, uh, you know, people dying that there's, and people are saying that it's related to COVID-19. But um, again, we, we need to, to um, continue to test and to get the data so that we would know whether or not these are just anecdotal or, or um, what have you. So at this point, I want to turn it over to our, to our co-host co um, for this session. Thank you very much for all of your great questions and comments. Uh, uh, we'll continue to um, talk about this on our, all of our social platforms, the um, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and uh, thank you again for everyone participating and for staying over. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Ariel to, to do the closing remarks. Thank you so much, Twain, and thank you to, to all of our speakers. This was a really fruitful discussion and to all of our participants and all of your comments and questions in the chat box to make this a, a dynamic conversation. We really appreciate it. We will be sharing the slides and the recording for everyone who is registered for the webinar uh, either later today or tomorrow so you can look out for those and feel free to share them as as widely as possible and as Troyan mentioned please do continue the conversation um, on on Twitter as as we move forward um, we have been receiving some some good news uh, over the last few weeks about some partnerships and things that have been established thanks to these webinars um, so if you have met people established partnerships for your work um, that that you think that where in this webinar series played a role, please let us know. We would love to share the story um, with this community that we've built um, and with, with our global network. So please do um, let us know how things are going for you. If you're able to establish you know, any relationships or partnerships on the, through, through this series. Um, our next webinar will be on June 4th. Um, and the topic that we're looking at for, for that webinar is actually Melissa alluded to it in her last few comments um, around how we can improve access to information, particularly for informal settlements and low income populations. Um, accurate information as it pertains to COVID-19, um, there's been a lot of in misinformation that's been published um, and getting put out there. So we're really looking at, at what organizations are doing to ensure um, accurate information is, is out there. Um, so, uh, and, and we'll be sending out a, a short, very short survey after this, uh, after this webinar to you to, to get your thoughts and inputs on what's been helpful, what's not, um, how you would like us to continue these going forward. Uh, if you have new ideas for, for formats or structures, welcome, we welcome your ideas. Um, so once again, thank you so much to all of the speakers. Thank you so much uh, to all of the participants. Um, and we wish you a wonderful afternoon and uh, stay healthy and stay safe.